Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Ronak from uh, Sri Lakshmi Narayan Institute of Medical Sciences, Pondicherry. I am a surgery assistant professor. This class is going to be on uh, cranial trauma and head injury, which is a very, very common uh, injury when uh, RTA or a polytrauma is encountered in our setting. We are going to discuss about the epidemiology, the classification, the biomechanics behind the injury, the pathophysiology. Then we are going on to the types of injury, diffuse injury and focal injury. Then we'll talk about skull fractures and finally the management. The most commonly affected group is of young people and the causes are RTA followed by fall, followed by assaults. Males are more likely, around three to one ratio between males to females. The classification of head injury is, can be done on a multiple basis. One of them is based on GCS, which is the Glasgow Comma Scale. Then another one based on CT scan. And third one based on clinical classification, that is a primary or secondary injury or a focal or a diffuse injury. This is the Glasgow Comma Scale, as all of you must be already aware of it. It sees response, uh, it sees uh, three behaviors, eye opening response, the best verbal response, the best motor resp response. And uh, the best eye opening response is four, the best verbal response is five, and the best motor response is six. The minimum responses are one each. So that makes the total, uh, uh, the minimum possible score to be three and the maximum possible score to be 15. A score of eight or less is that of a comatose patient. Now, as per GCS classification, a mild injury is, uh, is in a patient with a GCS of between 13 and 15. A moderate injury is between uh, 9 and 12. And a severe injury is between 3 and 8. GCS comes with some advantages and some disadvantages. The advantage is that it is, it is uh, constant across all the users, all the interpreters. And uh, inter or intraday observation is very easy. And it is reliable. It is uh, not useful. It is useful not only in uh, traumatic brain injury, but also in other neurological conditions. The disadvantages, uh, however, are that if there are people who are sedated or are paralyzed, we cannot assess the GCS. Also, patients who are intubated or have orbital swelling or uh, uh, or have neck swelling or neck injury cannot be assessed GCS well. This is an example. A patient with an anterior skull-based fracture with severe periorbital edema, it makes it impossible to open the eyes passively. In such a case, the GCS is E1 because there is no spontaneous eye opening. And hence, the GCS comes, the total GCS comes out to be 12 on 15, even though the patient is fully conscious. This is another example of an intubated patient with an associated nasal injury. And again, the patient has a normal eye opening, a normal motor response, but because of the intubation, it is a VT. And the GCS is written as 11T over 15. Now, based on imaging, uh, Marshall CT classification is done, uh, which, has, uh, which is for diffuse injury and uh, can be uh, classified into four grades, grade one, two, three, and four. Uh, grade one, there is a normal CT scan, Grade two has the systems present, but the shift of less than five millimeters. In grade three, the systems are compressed or absent. The shift is more than five millimeters. In grade four, only shift is more than five, uh, five millimeters. And uh, it is associated with increasing mortality rates. On the clinical classification, it can be classified as primary brain injury, secondary brain injury. Primary brain injury is uh, that is direct and immediate at the time of injury, the brain injury. The, it's of two types, focal and diffuse. Secondary brain injury is the injury which happens later which, because of the cellular damage. Whatever the primary uh, brain injury changes are there, they further uh, go on to cause a secondary brain injury. Secondary brain injury is also important to a neurosurgeon because it is preventable by intervention. Now, focal brain injury versus diffuse brain injury. A focal brain injury is a macroscopically visible injury to the brain parenchyma, a macroscopically visible damage to the brain parenchyma, and it is limited to a well-defined area, whereas a diffuse injury is widespread, and it is without macroscopically visible trauma to the brain parenchyma. Now, the clinical classification, uh, head injury can be classified into primary head injury, secondary head injury. Primary head injury can again be classified into focal and diffuse. Focal injuries are of... Uh, 
confusion and hemorrhage confusion could be coop counter coop intermediate coop hemorrhages could be edh that is extra dural hemorrhage subdural hemorrhage and intracranial hemorrhage skull fractures could be uh, for the vault it could be a linear or depressed fracture or it could be a basilar fracture that is the skull based fracture now diffuse injuries can be the concussion or a diffuse exonal injury we will be talking about all of these injuries and their uh, management further down in this presentation so a little uh, test for you guys what is the following which of the following statements regarding glasgow comma scale is true a the minimum score is 0 b inappropriate word is scored as 2 i opening to command a speech scored as 2 a gcs of 6 means the patient is in coma which of the is true so a gcs of 6 is a patient in coma we talk that the gcs of 8 or less is defined as a comatose patient now when does primary brain injury occur at the moment of impact which of the following can cause a secondary brain injury hypoxia hypertension raised icp reduced cerebral perfusion we'll go on to read that all of these are uh, things which are a result of a trauma and all of them will uh, further go on to cause a secondary brain injury now we'll talk about the biomechanics the biomechanics of uh, injury there are two types of forces one can be a static loading one can be a dynamic loading a static loading is a loading which is which lasts more than 200 milliseconds whereas a dynamic loading is something which lasts less than 50 milliseconds a dynamic loading further has a impact loading and a impulsive loading the impact loading is a contact plus an inertial force whereas in the impulsive uh, loading only the inertial force acts pathophysiology uh, we will be talking about cerebral auto regulation that is the uh, cbf the cpp and the icp the cerebr- we will talking about cerebral edema which could be cytotoxic or vasogenic and finally we will be talking about brain herniation which can be uncle tonsillar or other herniation now this is a monroe kelly hypothesis this is a very very important hypothesis when it comes to brain injury and it states that cranial compartment is incompressible and that the volume inside the cranium is fixed the cranium and its constituents that is the blood the cerebrospinal fluid and the brain tissue create a state of volume equilibrium such that any increase in volume of one of the cranial constituents must be compensated by a decrease in the volume of another that means if there is a increase in the csf volume the brain tissue volume has to decrease and the blood volume has to decrease so when the brain tissue volume is decreasing the brain matter is getting compressed and when the blood volume is decreasing the cerebral perfusion pressure is uh, reducing for example an increase in lesion volume that is in a epidural hematoma will be compensated by downward displacement of cns and the venous blood if uncompensated it may lead to uh, lead to a increase in the intracranial pressure so we'll be talking about cerebral auto regulation which is defined as maintenance of a constant level of cerebral blood flow in the presence of alteration in systemic arterial pressure that means that even when the systemic arterial pressure falls the cerebral blood flow is maintained it is maintained by cerebral auto regulation so when the mean arterial pressure is even if it is around 50 the cerebral blood flow is around 50 even when the pressure keeps going up the cerebral blood flow is maintained at the same level when the pressure falls beneath 50 in cases of a trauma the cerebral blood flow is going to decrease now we'll talk about the cushing's reflex a cushing's reflex is very very important reflex when it comes to neurotrauma uh, it it will be encountered when there is a increased intracranial pressure and it is characterized by hypertension bradycardia and diminished respiratory effort all three of these things will be present uh, simultaneously and a increase in bp and a reduced uh, heart rate is a characteristic of cushing's reflex it is different from normal trauma other trauma uh, hypovolemic shock because in normal hypovolemic shock you would encounter a reduced blood pressure with a increased heart rate however in a patient with a head injury you would 
encounter an increased blood pressure with a reduced heart rate and whenever you encounter this in a trauma patient you should think of head injury and think of cushing reflex now this this thing is called the cushing triad wherein there is hypertension bradycardia and diminished respiratory effect effort all of you should be on the lookout for this reflex now calculation how do we calculate the cerebral blood flow cerebral blood flow is the ratio of cerebral perfusion pressure and cerebrovascular resistance now cerebral perfusion pressure is the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure now the thing is how do we measure the intracranial pressure the okay we'll come to that the intracranial pressure is uh, measured by the intraventricular pressure we put a uh manometer into the ventricle and we measure the pressure there normal values the normal uh, cerebral blood flow is of 45 to 65 milliliters per 100 grams per minute the normal cerebral perfusion pressure is that of 70 to 100 millimeter of mercury if the cerebral perfusion pressure is less than 50 there will be permanent neurological damage because of the hypoxia the normal intracranial pressure is between 5 to 50 millimeters of mercury in cases of intracranial hypertension or raised intracranial pressure the elevation there is a elevation of this pressure in the cranium and intracranial pressure of 20 to 25 mm of mercury is uh, is the upper limit and the treatment uh, to reduce this intracranial pressure will be required now cerebral edema there is a net increase in the water content of the cerebral tissue that leads to an increase in the overall brain mass it's a multiple types we'll be talking of two of them is cytotoxic it could be vasogenic it could be osmotic it could be hydrostatic it could be interstitial like in a hydrocephalus now cytotoxic edema cytotoxic edema or the intracellular edema is the result of influx of sodium due to the failure of energy dependent ion pumps which leads to a shift in water from the extracellular to the intracellular uh, membrane the blood brain barrier in cytotoxic edema is intact and there is no enhancement on ct or mri even after iv contrast In vasogenic edema, there is an impairment of the blood-brain barrier that leads to a shift of water from the intravascular to the extravascular compartment. It is characterized by protein-rich fluid in the extracellular space and a hypodense white matter on CT scan. Osmotic brain edema is a critical reduction in the serum osmolality. It reduces it. Uh, it may occur in iatrogenic hemodilution from excessive use of intravenous dextrose and uh, solutions in uh, SIADH. This is the reason that 5D is not supposed to be used in patients of head injury. We will talk more about it later on in my presentation. Then there is a hydrocephalic or an interstitial edema, which is because of the periventricular extravasation of water because of the high pressure in obstructive hydrocephalus. It is an uncommon event in head injury and more likely to be encountered in uh, patients with congenital uh, deformities or congenital hydrocephalus. and there is hydrostatic edema with there is a sudden increase in intravascular or transmural pressure in an intact vascular bed and it results in extracellular accumulation of protein poor fluid so when there is a protein protein poor fluid outside it's going to pull the water in and uh, it is seen when the auto regulation is defective after head injury so these are patients that you will find in icu who are taking time to recoup and uh, taking time to come out of the ventilator so in those patients the edema that is encountered is more often hydrostatic edema now this is a classification which uh, by which you can differentiate between different types of edema now we'll talk about brain herniation brain herniation is a dangerous side effect of a very high intracranial pressure that occurs when part of brain is squeezed across the structures within the skull you have to understand that skull unlike the abdomen or any other uh, compartment of the body is a very very close space and any increase in pressure is going to lead to a herniation that is some of the part of the matter the occupant the original occupant of that wall needs to go out to compensate for the new occupant of the wall so there can be multiple herniations the uncus look at my pointer the uncus can herniate or the central region of the brain may herniate or the cingulate region of the brain may herniate from one side to another side there can be a transcalvarian 
uh, herniation. There can be an upward herniation, which is rare. And then can, there can be a tonsillar herniation through the foramen magnum. Now there are some herniation syndromes that you should know about. There is a supratentorial herniation syndrome. That is a, there is a infratentorial herniation syndrome. In these cases, we are talking in respect of the tentorium, the tentorium cerebri, the tent in the head. This is made by the meninges, the dura mater. It forms a tent-like structure and it divides one part of the brain from another. And a herniation through this tent is known as a supratentorial or infratentorial herniation. In a supratentorial herniation, the uncus herniates, or there can be a subcalcium herniation of the cingulate, or there can be a central or transcalcium. In the infratentorial, there can be an upward cerebral herniation, and there can be tonsillar herniation. Now you can look at the figure a little more closely. You can uh, correlate about what is going on where. You can see that this is the uncus, this is the tentorium, and the uncus herniates from supratentorial region to an infratentorial region. This is an infratentorial herniation, wherein you can see that there is an upward cerebral herniation to the tentorium. So the cerebrum from below the tentorium, the cerebellum from below the tentorium is herniating to a position above the tentorium. Now a little bit more about uncle uh, herniation. What you must know about uncle herniation is that the oculomotor nerve will be compressed against the free edge of the tentorium by the herniating uncle, and it will lead to a ipsilateral pupillary dilatation. This is important because when a patient comes and you and you uh, examine the pupil of the patient, and one of the pupil is reactive and the other is not, you must think of this thing then it can also be a result of the compression of the ipsilateral side of brain stem, which causes contralateral weakness. So in a person with uncle herniation will present to you with an ipsilateral pupillary dilatation and a contralateral weakness. Now we will talk about a very important phenomena which is called as the Carnohan phenomenon. In a massive herniation, the cerebral peduncle on the opposite side to the hernia may be indented by the tentorium itself and produces a Carnohan's notch, that is, a false localizing and a paradoxical ipsilateral semiparesis. We talked in the previous slide that the uh, paralysis is going to be contralateral and the pupillary dilatation is going to be ipsilateral. However, because of the herniation of the affected side, the other side at the notch is also getting affected and it is causing an ipsilateral weakness. Now we will talk about a dreaded, dreaded problem that we encounter with uh, brain trauma, which is called diffuse brain injury. A diffuse brain injury is something wherein the entire brain matter is affected. That is, it is not limited to one part of the brain, but multiple parts of the brain. Now, as we had seen this earlier, the primary brain injury was focal or diffuse. Now, diffuse brain injury would comprise of concussion and diffuse axonal injuries. Now, first we'll talk about concussion. The concussion is not a very, very problematic thing. Concussion is usually self-resolving. Usually the patient is gonna come out and uh, we'll have good results. It is the mildest form of diffuse traumatic brain injury. It results in transient alteration of consciousness, followed by a rapid return to normal state of alertness. We will talk later in EDH, that is extradural hematoma, how this can also be a warning sign and uh, this should definitely, definitely be uh, di differentiated from EDH, which uh, gives us a transient uh, uh, alertness. Okay. So this will result in a transient alteration of consciousness, which is followed by a rapid return to a normal state. Uh, retrograde amnesia is a hallmark of concussion. A patient with concussion is gonna tell you, I got injured, I know where I was walking, 
then I do not know what happened. I just woke up with a head injury. He is going to forget how he got the injury. That is the retrograde amnesia. And it is hallmark of a concussion. It could be due to a rotational acceleration. It could be due to an angular acceleration of the head in absence of a significant mechanical contact. What this means is I need not get hurt on my head over here. Just the angular motion of my head is enough for my brain to hit against my skull and get conquered. There need not be a direct trauma from outside. A trauma, an angular trauma, an angular acceleration or a rotational acceleration is enough to cause this sort of a concussion. The CT imaging will more often be normal and a DTI imaging may show you some abnormalities over bilateral hemispheres, but the patient will present to you with a full GCS. So uh, concussion has been uh, graded into grade one, grade two, grade three, and uh, there are multiple guidelines. You can uh, go through it and you can uh, probably classify when you encounter such patients. Now we'll go on to diffuse axonal injury. Diffuse axonal injury is something which uh, all neurosurgeons dread in a way. They dread because uh, there is no management. There is just no management and the patient most often will have to be left just like that and uh, only supportive care can be offered to the patient. A lot of patients come out, a lot of patients do not go out, come out, and uh, we lose them. So it was first described by a person called Stritch in 1956 as diffuse degeneration of white matter following severe brain injury, head injury. It is also known as a shearing injury or an inner cerebral trauma. It results from a severe angular and rotational acceleration, the acceleration that delivers shear and tensile forces to act. As a result, diffuse axonal injury is responsible for most traumatic brain injury patients that are severely impaired despite the lack of a gross parenchymal contusion, laceration, or hematoma. A coronal or a lateral acceleration injury produces the most severe DAI, whereas acceleration in oblique or sagittal pain result in less severe DAI. I will repeat. Uh, Acceleration injury in the coronal or lateral acceleration, the coronal plane or the lateral acceleration plane will produce the most severe diffuse axonal injury, whereas acceleration in oblique of the dietal will uh, result in less severe DI. Loss of consciousness is there from the onset. There is no lucid interval. Unlike in EDH, there is no lucid interval and the patient is in a coma or a pers persistent vegetable state. Now, a little bit more DAI is something which is very, very poorly understood right now. And uh, there are only a few things that we understand. We see some retraction balls, the proximal ends of the severed axon is the microscopic hallmark of uh, diffuse axonal injury. It is most often done uh, uh, post-mortem. This is a post-mortem finding. It is not an anti-mortem finding. The trauma should not be subjected to a... Uh, biopsy or brain biopsy for the sake of finding the eye. There is also punctate hemorrhage in the midbrain and the rostral pond, which is known as the stitch hemorrhage. The grading is in grade one, two, and three, according to the corpus callosum, the cerebral peduncle, and the cerebral peduncle element. Now we'll come to the focal uh, brain injuries, which is the most important topic for you guys. Focal brain injury can be either the contusion or a hemorrhage or a skull fracture. A contusion, we will start with contusion, we will go on to hemorrhage, then we will come to fracture. A contusion is a bruise of the cortical surface of the brain which results as a hemorrhage around the blood vessels. The overlying pia matter always remains intact. Pia matter, as you know, is the uh, layer of the dura is the layer of the meninges, which is most closely, pia means mother, so it is most closely attached to the brain. A laceration is when the overlying pia matter is compromised, and it's, uh, it's laceration. Contusions are most severe in the frontal and temporal poles, also known as polar contusions. 
types of confusions are coop count coop and intermediary coop a coop a count coop and a intermediary coop so a coop confusion is at the site of injury a count coop is at the opposite side because of the relative motion of the brain inside the wall and the intermediate and the intermediary coop contusion is a lesion that affects the deeper brain structures such as the corpus callosum the basal ganglia the hypothalamus and the brain stem that is something which is under all of this cortex in the midline of the brain because of the transmission of the forces over there now there are also some things known as fracture contusions which are associated with the fracture you can see over here there is a frontal fracture on the right side and there is a contusion associated with that then there could be gliding contusions which are focal hemorrhages involving the cortex and there is white matter of the superior margin in cerebral hemisphere then there are hernial contusions we herniation contusions we have talked about the hernias earlier now the contusions which are associated with those hernias are known as herniation contusions now something uh, about contusion and hematoma the amount of blood in a lesion determines whether the lesion is classified as a contusion or hematoma if blood accounts for less than 2/3 of the lesion it is a contusion if blood amounts for more than 2/3 of the lesion it is a intracellular hematoma now hematomas would uh, require a surgical intervention that is require a drainage procedure because they produce a mass effect a volume effect and should be taken out wherever uh, indicated we will first talk about edh edh is the most important surgical emergency in neurosurgical setup and all edh is must be operated must be operated must be operated it is a collection of the blood between the inner table of the skull and the dura which is the, the periosteal layer of dura and there is a extension of the hematoma which is usually limited by the suture line owing to the tight attachment of dura at these locations the shape of edh is very very classical it occurs in young adults and is rare in children below 2 years and elderly above 60 years as the dura is very adherent to the overlying bone hence there is no place for the blood to collect in the pediatric patients above 2 years edh is relatively more common because there is an abundance of diploic and dural vascularization which is actually the vessels that bleed on imaging the classic ct appearance is seen in 84% of the cases which show a hyperdense biconvex a hyperdense hyperdense biconvex biconvex lesion the formula to calculate the volume of edh is abc by 2 that is a is one dimension b is another dimension and the c is the three dimensional the other dimension that we'll see uh, according to the number of cuts of the ct scan that are involved so if you're taking a 2 mm cut and you you can see the lesion across 20 cuts then you have a 40 mm lesion in that uh, dimension the classic appearance is uh, seen in 84% patient and the formula is we discuss the formula now there is another thing called the swirl sign which was first described by zimmerman in 1982 it is a small rounded lesion isolates to the brain which represents an active extravasation of unclotted blood the clotted component is hyperdense which is 50 to 70 hounsfield unit whereas this one will be a hypodense which is comparable to the normal brain matter edh is found in skull fracture patients the hematoma arises in middle meningeal artery in two thirds of patients and the middle meningeal artery in one third of patients and from the diploic vein or torn dural venous sinuses in the remainder of the patient the locations of the edh are in the temporoparietal region for 73% of the patient and in the anterior cranial fossa in 11% of the patient i'll repeat the location for edh is in the temporoparietal region for 73% of the patient and the antero anterior cranial fossa for 11% of patient in the parasagittal region in the parasagittal region for 9% patient and in the posterior fossa for 7% patient now let us talk about lucid interval lucid interval is something which will kill the patient if overlooked the patient will uh, come to you saying patient had the initial confusion or decreased consciousness or a loss of consciousness and then he he might present fully conscious in a restored mental status and the patient will uh, feel like he is back to the normal self 
but these patients should not be allowed to go without a ct scan because there will be a sudden change in mental status the patient will become confused sleepy and will develop one dilated pupil hemiparesis and become comatose however lucid interval is not pathognomonic for eds other post traumatic mass lesions can also present in a similar manner but we must all be on a lookout for this lucid interval now uh, we will talk about the guidelines for surgery in cases of an acute eds if it is greater than 30 cubic centimeter it should be surgically evacuated regardless of the patient's glasgow coma score in an eds less than 30 cubic centimeter with a less than 15 mm thickness with less than 5 mm midline shift in patient with gcs of more than 8 without focal deficit can be managed non operatively with serial ct scan it is strongly recommended that patients with acute eds coma with an isocoria undergo surgical evacuation as soon as possible and uh, we will now talk about craniotomy and edh evacuation uh, extra dural hematoma is evacuated by a uh, surgery known as craniotomy in which the part of the cranium is taken out the and the hematoma is encountered outside the dura the dura is hence not open the hematoma is just taken out the hematoma is been evacuated then the skull flap will not be put and uh, the skin will be closed letting it uh, letting some space there leaving some space there for any further collection now we will talk about acute subdural hematoma the last one was a extra dural hematoma this blue line is the dura the first uh, thing we talked about was a extra dural hematoma which was occurring outside the dura now we talk about a subdural hematoma wherein the dura is intact and the hematoma is occurring under the uh, dura between the dura and the brain matter it is found when venous or rarely arterial blood dissects between dura and the arachnoid now in imaging it uh, the classic appearance is crescent trick or a concave or convex concave or convex concave or convex appearance so you can uh, think of a edh like a lemon like a lemon and uh sdh like a banana now sdh is based on time it could be acute subacute or chronic the consistency and the ct density is here then there can be a isolated acute sdh or a burst lobe acute sdh isolated sdh is due to rupture of breathing veins whereas a burst lobe is uh, continuous with a confused lacerated brain tissue with intracranial hemorrhage in an isolated acute sdh there will be no brain damage and this patients will uh, may experience a brief lucid interval whereas uh, this uh, the burst lobe complex will have a cerebral contusion and the adjacent intracerebral hematoma will be termed as the burst lobe why sdh is more common than sah sah is sub arachnoid hematoma the cortical vessels in the arteries that travel in the uh, travel in the subarachnoid space if it bleeds due to trauma it should result in subarachnoid bleed cortical bleeding veins with the within the subarachnoid space are of uniform thickness and are supported by the arachnoid tubercular mortality in uh, acute sdh is uh, varies between 30 to 90% the poor outcome is due to ischemic brain damage in the hemisphere underlying the hematoma The most important factor leading to this ischemic damage is raised intracranial pressure, producing impaired cerebral perfusion. It is thought that coexisting brain damage, that is, diffuse external injury, confusion, laceration, is responsible for poor neurological function after injury. Excessive activation of excitatory neurotransmitter receptors, receptors, particularly the NNDA receptor, can cause neuronal damage. indistinguishable uh, indistinguishable from the ischemic necrosis now this is the surgical management of acute sdh please go through it so you can see it is a little, little different from the management of eds in cases of edh we were operating uh, earlier and we were operating almost all patients in sdh the approach is a little more conservative 
This is the craniotomy for acute SDH. You can see that the dura has also been opened. This is the dura. In SDH, we did not have any dura opening. This is the dura has been opened and the clot is underneath the dura. A chronic SDH is a subdural hematoma, which is discovered two or three or longer weeks after the initial injury. Most thin acute SDH will resolve on their own and only with uh, uh, patients, uh, some patients will uh, uh, go on to have a chronic SDH. There are some predisposing factors for uh, developing chronic SDH. One of them is old age. It will develop in alcoholics. It will develop in an atrophic brain. And it will be in a patient with multiple trivial trauma, like in Parkinson's disease, where the patient keeps hitting the head against something. So if this is a wall and a patient with Parkinson's has a tremor, he will keep hitting the head against the wall again and again. And there will be multiple trivial traumas, which will finally lead to a chronic SDH. This is the pathophysiology of the chronic SDH. This is a burr hole evacuation, which is done for chronic SDH. In a chronic SDH patient, we need not take out the entire flap of the bone and uh, uh, leave that part open. We can, because the patient is stable, we can go ahead with a more conservative approach. That is a burr hole in which uh, two small holes are drilled into the cranium, into the skull, just overlying, just above the hematoma. The dura is open out here and the hematoma is evacuated. Now we'll talk about inter intracerebral hemorrhage. Intracranial hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage accounts for 20% of all traumatic intracranial hematoma. These are associated with extensive lobar contusion from which they are often difficult to distinguish. If the parenchymal bleed contains more than two thirds of clot, it is called an intracranial hemorrhage. If the parenchymal bleed has less than 202 by three of clot, it is known as a contusion. Patients on chronic anticoagulation therapy are at an increased risk of developing ICS even after a mild injury. So even in, uh, this is also true for patients who have a very, very low platelet count like in dengue or any other viral center, viral pathologies. A patient may have a spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage and patient will uh, present to us with a sudden uh, deterioration in uh, GCS and a sudden uh, fall in uh, heart rate with an increased BP as we had discussed earlier, pushing triad may set in. And the common sites are orbital, frontal, and frontolateral temporal lobes. A deeper uh, ICH may also occur in the basal ganglia and thalamus, but they are less common than all two percent. Now, interventricular hemorrhage will occur when uh, there is a large force, a heavy force involved in uh, primary IVH. There will be no parenchymal bleed. In the secondary IVH, it will be extension from the primary ICH. And the treatment is an external ventricular drainage in case of raised ICP. You can see these are the ventricles. These are normally black in color because they're filled with CSF. However, right now there is some bleed and some clot over here because of which they are white. So we will insert an external drain and we will just drain this ventricle. Now we will talk about traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. <clears throat> the centripetal uh, Theory of Omaya and Generali suggests that lesion depth is dependent on the force of injury. Accordingly, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage results from relatively severe injury to the brain. High angular acceleration uh, of long duration is necessary to produce a strain that causes rupture of the superficial vessels in the arachnoid system. Now we will talk about uh, skull fractures. Skull fracture can be linear or depressed. The linear fracture can be a vault fracture or a basilar fracture. A vault fracture could be open and closed. A basilar fracture, that is skull base fracture, can be a temporal or sphenoid or occipital condylar fracture or cranial pot fracture. We'll talk as it comes. This is a linear fracture. You can see it is a linear fracture. It is a line-like fracture transcending from the temporal region through the frontal region going on to the coronal sulcus. This is a depressed fracture. Then you can see there is a depression in the skull. This is a simple closed fracture wherein the skin is still intact and the bone is not exposed. This is a compound or open fracture wherein the bone is exposed. This is called a hinge door fracture wherein there is a hinge-like door from outside to inside. 
and this is a commuted fracture community fracture in which there are multiple fragments of the same fracture and you can also see a fragment over here this could be a projectile which entered from here because of which there was a community fracture over here now this is the surgical management of cranial fractures i'll simplify it for you so a patient with a open fracture should be given antibiotics and a surgical intervention should be attempted a patient with a open compound depressed clinical fracture may be treated non operatively if there is no clinical or radiological evidence and no dura involvement early operation is recommended to reduce the incidence of infection now the cranioplasty in uh, these patients with a depressed fracture or a bone loss can either be with a titanium mesh like this or a newer technique of 3d cranioplasty in which the uh, mesh is uh, the titanium mesh is designed according to the area which uh, requires this mesh now uh, talking about basilar fracture see this is a linear fracture that you can see till here from the inside if you see this fracture is continuing on to the base of the skull this is a basilar fracture this is the posterior fossa this is the anterior fossa this is the medial cranial fossa and the skull fracture is continuing through the base this is a pond fracture which is like which is because a pond is formed over here it is also known as ping pong ball fracture this is a growing skull fracture in some children the fracture may remain ununited and enlarged to form a growing skull fracture uh, the most common site would be the parietal bone but rare sites are occipital and the orbital group other names are leptomeningeal cyst a traumatic meningeal seal or a cranial cranial erosion the mechanism is that uh, fracture with the tearing of uh, dura where the csf leaks forms a collection now because the csf is under pressure and csf is pulsatile the transmitted pulsation from the subarachnoid space into the extra axial fluid collection causes a pressure and hence the enlargement of this fracture now we will talk about the basal skull fracture this is a temporal bone fracture as you can see these are both temporal bone fractures they can either be longitudinal that is along along the axis of the temporal bone or they can be transverse in the longitudinal fractures 80% of them 80% uh, of the temporal bone fractures are longitudinal but only 15 to 20% of them will involve the facial nerve however in case of a transverse fracture because because the facial nerve passes through this region a transverse fracture is very very likely almost a 50% facial nerve involvement chance these are some changes there are some differences between a longitudinal and transverse fracture you can see that the facial nerve damage is less common in cases of longitudinal fracture uh, but hearing loss is common hemotympanion is common nystagmus is common otoregia is common and vertigo is common in a longitudinal fracture in a longitudinal fracture which is going along the auditory canal a uh, skull base fracture uh, classically present with the raccoon eye a uh, raccoon eye this is a raccoon this is a raccoon eye this is because the blood the blood finally collects around the loose tissue around the orbit this is the battle sign which is uh, in the mastoid region hematoma and there can be csf rhinorrhea because of fracture of the face now uh, we will talk about some controversies we will talk about steroids in head injury uh, historically steroids were indicated then there was a time when steroids were considered the mainstay and the rambam in head injury however now we've come to a time when steroids are not recommended for improving outcomes or reducing the intracranial pressure in patients with severe traumatic brain injury high dose methylphenicillone was associated with increased mortality and is now contraindicated what happens is that when we give a high dose of corticosteroid the patient stops throwing up symptoms so as a clinician uh, the clinician might think that the patient is improving however it is not so it's only that the patient is not throwing up the symptoms the patient is further deteriorating and it is associated with higher mortality and morbidity we'll uh, talk a little bit about beta 2 transferrin it is produced by 
neuraminidase activity in the brain and is found abundantly in the CSF. It occurs in lower concentrations in the perilymph and the cochlea and the aqueous and the venous hemorrhage of the gland. Since it is not normally contained in nasal secretions, its detection allows for indirect diagnosis of CSF rhinorrhea. This is, uh, this is used to differentiate between rhinorrhea and CSF rhinorrhea. If a patient comes to you with a running nose, with a history of head injury, we should do a beta transferrin uh, test on the running node. And if there is beta transferrin, beta transferrin is present, then it is more likely to be CSS than to be just like a normal rhinorrhea. Now we will talk about uh, levetiracetam and phenytoin and uh, which should be given because a lot of patients with head injury are going to present to you with uh, seizures. So at the present time, there is insufficient evidence to recommend uh, levetiracetam over phenytoin uh, regarding efficacy and preventing early post-traumatic seizures. Both are prescribed with none better than the other. But uh, uh, in a patient with a traumatic brain injury, it should not be prophylactically loaded with uh, eptoin or phenytoin. But in a patient who has presented to us with seizures, should be given 1200 milligrams of phenytoin as a loading dose, followed by a maintenance dose. The ICP monitoring, which we were talking about earlier, should be monitored in all salvageable patients with severe brain trauma, that is a GCS of three to eight after resuscitation and an abnormal CT scan. And uh, it, is, it is most commonly done with an intraventricular probe because it is not affected by local clots as the intraparenchymal bleed. It can be calibrated easily. It can be inserted after evacuation of subdural or epidural hematoma. And uh, the only problem is it is difficult to insert the intraventricular probe if there is a diffuse cerebral edema. And uh, we may also cause a lot of iatrogenic injury while trying to enter into the ventricle at this time. Now, 5% dextrose solution should not be, should not be, should never be given in a patient with trauma because it causes osmotic brain edema. It is a free water solution. Dextrose gets metabolized and the plasma osmolality is decreased. This increases the brain edema in head injury and hence should be avoided. 5% dextrose in 0.9% saline does not have the same effect as it does not decrease the plasma osmolality. So DNS may be given, but 5B should never be given. With this, we come to an end uh, for a lecture. Thank you everybody for uh, attending this uh, lecture. I am Dr. Ronak Saj. I am Assistant Professor at Department of General Surgery at Sri Lakshminarayan Institute of Medical Sciences in Pondicherry. Thank you.